Hey everyone, uh, we are joined today by Pete Barak, and uh, he's a great uh, person to talk to you about evangelization. He definitely has uh, fire of the Holy Spirit working within him. And, uh, grateful that you can join us, Pete, today. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you involved with uh, the work of evangelization. Sure. Well, thank you, Father Chris. It's good to be with you. Uh, yeah, what got me involved in the work of evangelization? Well, uh, I was born, right? And I was baptized, which started things off in the right foot. Um, but I came to find out many years later that I was raised in uh, what was more of an exceptional Catholic family and that not only did we go to Mass every weekend, uh, we prayed the rosary more than I liked growing up. And uh, But more importantly, I had two parents who were real believers, real disciples, uh, real missionary disciples in that they were... Um, regularly sharing the gospel with people. I remember being sent to bed and then kind of creeping down the hallway and there'd be strangers in the living room. And wouldn't you know it, my parents were talking to them about the Lord and, and even sometimes praying with them and regularly bringing people to Christ right in our, in our living room. And probably the most significant thing that, um, well, two most significant things I should say that kind of put me on this path growing up was I met the Lord when I was pretty young, about eight years old, where I had a series of experiences, encounters with Jesus Christ, where I just came away knowing that God was real and he loved me. That was kind of the theme of my, really the theme of my life, but the theme that emerged when I was eight years old, that God is real and he loves me. And I knew that because the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on me in a, in a new and more powerful way that I met the Lord Jesus in a, in a way that I said yes to him and began to follow him even at eight years old. But then I also opened myself up to the power of his Holy Spirit. And power and the, the the role of Pentecost in our life really became alive in me. And we could get into a whole variety of ways of how I knew that. But needless to say, there was a fire that was built in me even at a young age. That was pretty significant. And then the second thing was, I can think of probably 30 or so men who really cared about my spiritual life growing up uh, that weren't my just my dad. And I didn't realize this, but my parents had given permission to all of my friends' parents to help disciple me. And you've heard the adage, it takes a village to raise somebody. Well, it really takes a village to disciple somebody too. And so I could go over to any number of my friends' houses and we'd be sitting there watching football like guys do. And Mr. Rolf would say, hey, you know, how's basketball going? And then I'd tell him and then he'd say, hey, uh, what's Jesus doing in your life? And that wasn't unusual. That was a little, again, sometimes a little annoying and a little uncomfortable for a 13-year-old boy. But it, it spoke volumes to the fact that it wasn't just my parents who believed in all this stuff. It was a lot of other men who I really respected. And for a young man in particular, but also for young women, it's uh, vitally important that they see other adults who are confirming what they're hearing in the home. And so between those two things uh, has really set me on a path. And then the Lord took me on all sorts of different journeys through the, my high school and university years and ultimately getting the opportunity now to uh, work with Renewal Ministries. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Pete. Um, just to dive in, I, I sent out a number of questions uh, or I'll open up the door to questions that uh, some of our people who are going through this discipleship uh, kind of uh, seminar through uh, with. And uh, some of the questions that they asked were, um, one particular stood out to me was, whether or not we're called to evangelize if we haven't um, been able to kind of express what our testimony story is. Like we haven't had this big experience of God, um, but we still have faith in him. We still trust in him. Are we still called to evangelize? How would you respond to that question? Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh, question where two things can kind of be true at once. One, uh, any faith is supernatural any expression of faith, no matter how seemingly small and significant, boring, whatever your testimony is of faith, of, of coming to belief in Jesus Christ as the Lord of the universe and Savior of all mankind, that is a movement of God. Scripture tells us nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So if you say that Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart. Whether it, it doesn't seem like anything dramatic, I think sometimes we... we um, think that testimonies have to be some sort of big, dramatic, you know, I was shooting up heroin in my eyeballs, and then all of a sudden the skies opened up, and St. Michael the Archangel was there, and he hit me with a sword, and now I believe. Like, those are really fun to hear, and they're very inspiring, and they give us a glimpse of what could happen for those who are maybe the furthest from God at this point. But for the vast majority of us, it's a, a series of relatively simple, relatively normal, and even in some ways ordinary decisions and um, movements of the will, our will, to continue to believe uh, what has been taught to us. So I think that can be true, that there's 
Now, I know that to be true, that that any step towards God is a, is a grace-filled moment and something that he's working through. At the same time, if, if you're saying, well, but I don't know if I've ever actually had like an encounter with Jesus Christ. I don't know if I've ever actually kind of like met him and, and made a decision to fall in love with him and give him my time, my talent, my treasure, really kind of a, a St. Paul moment uh, uh, where you know, you come into a realization of the glory and majesty of Jesus and you make a decision. Now, again, we're not all going to have that moment where he appears to us and we're struck blind and that changes everything. But we are all called to uh, coming to a place of a conscious, personal, intentional decision to follow the one we have, are falling in love with. And so I think two things could be true at once. One could be that, yeah, there may not be this big, dramatic, symbol crashing intense moment of conversion at the same time the the experience of walking with jesus should carry with it some different kind of experiential elements uh and just like you fall in love with a spouse just like you fall in love with and you you have a relationship with the people in your life yeah there's a there's a certain normalcy and a humdrum everyday quality to it but there's also key moments along the way that confirm it that that propel us forward and so um if you're a faithful person who said, yeah, I've been a faithful Catholic for 30 years, but I don't know if I've ever really had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Well, I'd say like, ask for it, you know, be bold. I mm -hmm. say, Lord, I want to meet you in a new and more powerful way. I know that you have more for me. I mean, I think what could be hidden within that, that, um, that statement of I've never really met him is a certain uh, complacency. If I could be so bold that are we satisfied with that? Because when I look at the lives of the saints and, and I look at scripture the heroes of the church that we rise up, that we hold up, never seem to be satisfied with where they are. They always recognize there's more. They always recognize there's a new depth, and they are bold enough to ask for it. I, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking of um, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross and how she had some pretty ordinary experiences, and yet all the same mystical at the same time. Um, her two, two strongest reasons for conversion um, were just a simple thing when she was just going out walking around and um, she saw this woman with groceries go into the church, kneel down and pray. And that had a profound impact on her. So here's this person praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament and she probably had the charism of that moment of faith and that generated faith in, in this atheist at the time, Edith Stein. And the second was when she encountered um, a friend of hers who had just lost her husband in, I think, in war. And um, she was amazed by how this woman wasn't broken by the loss of her husband, uh, but her faith gave her some consolation in the midst of that very challenging time. And these two instances are what she reflects on as being like the beginning of, of tapping into something that is supernatural encountering. Um, and then later on, uh, she read uh, St. Teresa of Avila's biography and she had a, a conversion through that. But, but it's, it's interesting how um, what we think might be an encounter with the Lord um, it might actually be very simple, but we might be experiencing something deep all the same in that encounter. And um, so I like how you, you said that, you know, but I do agree with you too. Like if we if we don't know the Lord, if, if there's something that you know we haven't had that experience of His divine finger pointing to us and His love uh, being communicated to us, um, it's very it's very difficult to convincingly um, promote the same gospel because that that lived experience is in the company what we're what we're sharing with other people. Yeah, I mean, John Paul II said conversion means. Uh, by accepting by personal decision, the saving sovereignty of Christ and becoming his disciple. So John Paul II recognized that there really is this, this personal encounter with a living God who loves you, who, which again, could be in very dramatic ways, or could be in very simple, still small voice ways. But either way, it's still coming to a place of recognition that uh, who God is and who you are in front of him and in giving him your life. I, I'm glad you referenced Teresa of Avila because she's, she's also very inspiring because I believe it was her who 
you know, went for like 18 years where she didn't really feel like she had any spiritual growth. You know, she here she is a nun and she goes for a long time of just kind of going through the motions and and holding on to all sorts of pet sins. And then all of a sudden in her 40s, she realizes her own stagnation and her own lethargy towards her spiritual life and then goes on to be one of the greatest spiritual writers we we have teaching us about spiritual union and, and all these fruits. And one of the things she says is people don't progress in the spiritual life largely because they don't want to, or they don't choose to, or they don't believe they can. A lot of people end up kind of reaching a certain level of faith and freedom from sin and all that, and then stop there because they just don't realize that, that it's possible to go deeper. And that's why the saints are such an incredible witness to us because they are very normal. They are, they are very human. And yet something supernatural has been done in them and they, they, they demonstrate to us in some ways, the like the epitome of union with God here on earth, um, which is both, at least for me, very exciting and often kind of intimidating. I think uh, maybe we could just for a moment dig into this whole concept of personal relationship with the Lord. I know growing up as, as a Catholic, that language was often associated with being Protestant um, or evangelical. Um, whereas Catholics had more of a relationship with routine, with tradition, um, why is having a personal relationship with the Lord a, a very real Catholic aspect of our Christian faith? And what does that involve? Is it just emotions? Obviously, you're emphasizing choices here, uh, commitment. How would you explain that? Well, it's important because God became man and we're human and human beings have relationship with each other. I mean, part of what we see in the person of Jesus Christ is uh, the revelation of the Father, uh, the embodiment of the Spirit, and then in a, this very incredibly exciting way, Jesus says it's better for the, the, the human physical form of Jesus to leave the earth so that he can pour out his Spirit on us so that we can actually have a deeper relationship with him than if he was physically walking the earth right now. So he, he comes and he, he does his work of salvation uh, with us, for us, uh, in, in human flesh, takes on human flesh and reveals the Father in a totally new and, and powerful way. And then through his ascension in the power of Pentecost, we then receive that same spirit that raised him from the dead. And we're drawn into a totally mystical, um, but very real relationship with him, deeper than any relationship we could have had, had he, if you know, like you and I could have, Father Chris. And yet then he also leaves us the Eucharist, which is the source and summit of this relationship, right? We are drawn where we can literally consume him and be fed by him. So as at the end of our lives, we've been fed for this journey towards heaven. So it's there's what's so awesome about the Catholic faith is it's incredible, incredibly mystical and mysterious, and also very tactile and real and very human. And we're not dualistic. We're not, we, we're not a, a soul over here and a body over here. We're body and soul in one person here in, in our human experience. And so the Lord recognizing that we have a a spiritual dimension to us and a very just physical dimension to us meets us on both levels, spiritually and physically. And, and it's just, um, you know, we're, we're not worshiping like a clay idol. We're not worshiping the spirit of the air. We're not worshiping mother earth. We're, we're worshiping a family, you know, we're being drawn into the father, son, and Holy spirit, which is the archetype of our family experience here. And then we also have the blessed mother who bears witness to a, a unique relationship with Jesus. And all these examples just paint this picture of a, of a God who is not detached, a God who is not um, remote, but a one who, who indwells in his creation. One who wants to be so united to us that we actually become him. <laughs> I mean, that, that is, that is, that's talk about like a personal relationship. If we just take it out of the, the lens of the evangelical mindset that has kind of co-opted that phrase, that what is more personal relationship than God dwelling within you, you being a temple of the Holy Spirit? It, there's no more personal relationship. And so uh, I think we just need to reclaim, even as Catholics, we, we, have, we, we're, we were the original purveyors of the personal relationship because we were fed by the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. We have received his Holy Spirit to, to empower us to live a new life. So, uh, and so how that manifests itself is, is a total consuming of all of what it means to be a human. Our mind, our souls, our intellect, our will, our emotions, they're all designed to be drawn into Jesus. You know, um, 
a lot of the popes talk about being possessed by the Holy Spirit, not like the exorcist, you know, where we lose control of ourselves and end up in the corner of the room or something, right? No, like possessed by the Holy Spirit that everything, our whole being is, is in a process of transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that means we shouldn't be afraid of our emotions. We should just properly understand them in the context of who we are as humans. I, I heard it once said that um, emotions are really wonderful companions and horrible leaders. They're wonderful companions along this journey. Mm -hmm. But if we let our emotions lead, that's a problem. Our, our, our will, our, our decision making, our intellect needs to be formed such that we can, as scripture tells us, transform by the renewal of your mind so that you can choose what is good and true and beautiful, right? And then we choose those things. And along the way, the Lord's going to, because we're human, allow us to experience motion, emotions that come with it. And if you're wondering if that's normal, just look at Jesus. He cried. He got angry. He laughed. I mean, there, there was the full gamut of emotions were in Jesus because he was human. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of rambling on here, but the, the, the idea being that the, this personal relationship with Jesus could not be more Catholic because it is the most improperly understood, a fully integrated divine and human interaction that, um, that we see actually its fullest expression in the Catholic Church. I was taken back by um, Benedict XVI's definition of, of faith, where he kind of says it's, it's the ascent of the whole person to God. And he's talking just like you did, you know, about in your mind, your heart, your intellect, your will. It's, it's everything that I am surrendering it to, to God. And there's nothing better than that, I think, to, to describe a relationship, right? It's, it's totally. even Jesus's words at the Last Supper. This is my body. He uses the Greek word soma, meaning everything that I am is given up for you. And so there's this, just this perfect exchange of um, total love given between us and, and god and, and when we're living that i think um there's a fire <laughs> burning in our hearts because there's like you said there, there's no human relationship that can be more intimate than that um in terms of uh, our relationship with christ and uh he who is also god can i say one thing about that you know yeah. which is which is why the then the moral teachings of the church have to flow from this dynamic Okay, so when everything I am, my mind, my body, my sexuality, my desires, my hopes, my dreams, all of it are his, and he's purifying it, then all of a sudden, when he asks me to, to, to do this, or not do this, or to be with this person, or not be with this person, or to live this way, or not live this way, all of a sudden, it's seen through the lens of him and his loving truth about who I am, what I'm made for and where I'm going and what it really takes in order to get there. And all of a sudden, then it just, it doesn't become this set of arbitrary rules that just seem like a bunch of kind of like old men who came up with a set of rules to ruin our weekend, right? But all of a sudden it's this loving plan of salvation that says to, in order to be united with love, truth, beauty, and goodness, we have to live love, truth, beauty, and goodness as love, truth, beauty, and goodness has revealed himself not on my terms no longer do i get to decide what is true and good and beautiful i am submitting myself to truth beauty and goodness in its fullness and letting him reveal the truth about who i am and, and what i'm made for and, and that's perfect because it segues into another question that was brought forward to us which is i think a common one you, you may hear often but I, I hear it quite often as well which is people who are practicing the Catholic faith in, in the sense that they're going to mass, but they struggle with some of the church's teaching. And I think one of the big ones that many struggle with um, is around human sexuality, which you just mentioned briefly. Um, and, and so how do we, if we're bringing someone to Christ, we're bringing them to his mind, to his designs, to, to his plan, his will. And, uh, and therefore, if we're leading someone away from the church's teachings, um, then we're leading them away from the mind and the heart to Christ. And, and so I think I would be curious, what would you say to someone if they, if they said, you know, I want to evangelize, but I have a hard time with the church's teaching on same-sex marriage, or I have a hard time on why women can't become priests, or I have a hard time on contraception, um, or maybe even like things like the Eucharist, or they don't have to be about sexual issues, it can be about so many different things. 
what what would you say as an encouragement, but also maybe a challenge to people that um, are coming from that place? Yeah, yeah, lot, lots of lots of different angles, lots of different thoughts on this. Um, I think right out of the bat, uh, a certain a righteous doubt is un- is is understandable. And um, I think in some ways valid. I mean, we are, we are creatures, we are rational creatures who should look at things and say, why do I believe what I believe? I, I don't think we should be afraid of um, a certain degree of questioning, a certain degree of wonder as to why does the church teach what she teaches, especially, in, and I think in most often the case in the, the, un, the below the belt issues, if you will, the, the human sexuality is the place that is often most contentious, most emotional, and most misunderstood. So you wind that all together, it creates quite a, a firestorm when it comes to evangelization, because it's the thing non-Catholics love to throw very quickly at Catholics in order to get us to shut up. And it's often the thing that we're most mischaracterized for, okay? Um, so you'll hear things like, you know, well, the church hates gay people and, you know, or the church doesn't want me to love my boyfriend or, you know, there's a thousand different things that the, the church wants to overpopulate the world or, you know, all, all these things. The church doesn't believe in the rights of women, like all, all this stuff. Right. And so I think there's, there's a, there's one angle to approach of saying, I, I want to in good conscience with a pure heart, seek the truth about these things. And which then implies a certain pursuit of the tr- truth that would require uh, some research and some questions and some and some conversations. The fact of the matter is, in all of these different topics, the church is not trying to figure it out as we go. Okay, the, certainly different expressions over the centuries has caused the church to spend more time defining certain things and clarifying things. But we're we're a part of an institution established by Christ that's been going on for a very long time. And people far smarter than you and me, Father Chris, have thought through this and written a lot of things about it, have, have given us a tremendous wealth of information. The question is, is are, are we disciplined enough and really truly pursuing the truth enough to unpack and tr- seek to understand what the tr- uh, church actually teaches about these things? I've yet to find many people who sincerely pursue the church's stance on whether it's homosexuality or adultery or fornication or masturbation or any of those things. I've very few people I know who've really spent the time to think about it, to in some ways even put aside their emotions for a time and just unpack it from more of a rational, reasonable, logical standpoint, who haven't come to at least the conclusion that the church has thought about this a lot and has really come up with legitimate reasons for the positions that she takes. Whether or not people ultimately agree with those reasons It's very hard to honestly look at what the church teaches and not say, well, at least there's been an effort to explain and a, in a quite a robust effort to explain. There's, there's no topic that the church hasn't probably spent God knows how much time, because there's always some theologian somewhere who wants nothing better than just sit in a room and think about this stuff. Right? So there's a tremendous amount of wealth, Uh, but that all being said, that doesn't carry a lot of weight in the common discussion right now, because most people don't really want to go on that down that road, don't have the patience for or the um, really the desire to honestly engage the church's position. They're more comfortable in the emotion of this. I don't like how this makes me feel. I don't like how this how this has made my friend feel. And I'm angry that the church has said this. I, I even when I sometimes what the church has been accused of saying, I'm angry about that. And um, I'm going to sit in, I'm going to kind of live through my emotions in this moment. That is almost like, it's not impossible to have a conversation around that topic, but it is very, very difficult when you encounter somebody whose reaction to everything that the church is teaching is born mostly out of an emotion and um, somewhat misunderstood experience. That's, that's very, very difficult. I find that over and over again, whenever I get into a conversation about some of these hot button topics. Before we dive into it, I often say like, listen, I, I I will gladly talk to you about why the church teaches what it teaches about homosexuality. But can we first talk about Jesus? Yeah. Can we first talk about who he is? Because if we're not in agreement about who God is and kind of the, the story of creation and where we come from and uh, the the human narrative that we're a part of, If we're not going to build on some of those common grounds, we're going to just be ships passing in the night because your 
anthropology, your meta narrative that governs the way you think is just going to be different than mine. And no amount of debate and no amount of explanation is actually going to find common ground there because you were literally starting from different positions, you know, like the Christian starting point is that we are made by a loving God to be in a loving relationship with him. But we have a fatal flaw in all of us called sin. And I'm called to chastity just as much as anyone else. And all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and all need a savior. And that say, that salvation is not possible through my own action, <laughs> that it is the action of God that saves. Whereas a lot of times the worldview is actually human beings have it within themselves, within government, within society to perfect ourselves, to save ourselves in such a way. There's a, there's a humanist savior that has arisen that as long as I'm free to choose who I want to be and who I want to love. And if everyone just kind of leaves me alone, if just institutions and, you know, the patron patrimony and all that just kind of leave me alone, I'll be okay. And actually I'll be fulfilled and we'll have the utopia that we all kind of long for. That's just a completely different worldview than what the Christian mind thinks about the world that yeah. without Jesus, we are dead in our sins and, and we're all deprived. <laughs> and we're all depraved yeah. uh, and, and different manifest, we all have different manifestations of that depravity. And so it, it's not that we want to run from those conversations. It's that I've just found, especially when it's kind of a, like a friend or a cousin or somebody who's, who's more intimately um, known by you to be able to take a step back and just say, can we talk about Jesus first? Because once Jesus becomes the lens by which you view life, then the moral teaching of the church, as I mentioned earlier, really starts to come into clarity. So I think we need to carry a great deal of empathy in our heart for anyone living in this struggle and living in this, this tension. I think we need to carry a great deal of kind of uh, sober sense of that when we enter into the world, the world is going to think differently about these things. We should not be surprised when the world does not understand who we are. That's, that's pretty normal. The world didn't understand Jesus. They, they, they put him to death. So we shouldn't be surprised when the world doesn't understand who we are. But at the same time, we should also carry a great deal of peace and confidence that what God has revealed about humanity, about our state, and about what we're made for is true. And, um, and we can know that not just because of an experience of it, but there is uh, a great deal of intellectual, um, robust thinking that goes behind everything we believe. Just to to give a concrete resource for anyone out there who is thinking about looking into the church's teachings on sexuality. Uh, one that I would recommend is Christopher West's um, Theology of the Bo Body for Beginners. It's a, it's not a very big book, but it's, it's excellent. And I, I had, um, as a teenager, I was presented with the Theology of the Body uh, from a net team that came to my parish and Father Graham. And uh, that kind of helped me understand the church's teaching. And particularly where the love is in the teaching um, because you know the, the church is often told like you were saying Pete that um, our position is loving but it's there's nothing more further from the truth than than um, what our, our church is teaching us about human sexuality on that issue um, but I do agree with you we need to we need to look at those teachings through the lens of a relationship with the Lord beginning from that place um, other, otherwise, um, we're not going to trust him. We're going to be afraid going in. Um, we're not going to defer to his ways and his designs. Um, but also, we're not going to be able to thank him for the beauty of what he's created. Right? Sure. We live in a culture today, which is all about nature. We, we love nature. We want to save the environment. Well, our bodies are part of the environment. And our bodies are part of the way in which God has created this universe. And we need to embrace and love that design that he's created in us and lead people to appreciate that and thank God for it. Because he's done, he's done incredible work. It's very good. Um, okay. I, I want to just end maybe with a couple more questions. Um, one is, okay. So there's some people that are just ready to go. They, they want to evangelize, um, but they're not really sure what their charisms are. And they're wondering what is the way to properly and effectively discern one char one's char charisms of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's great. Uh, a couple things I would quickly recommend. One is there are some just charism assessments that are out there, like called and gifted uh, and some other things that if you want to take something a little bit more structured, that will help you just give you a framework of maybe how you're wired. I think the best way to discern one's charism is, is through the context of community. So, um, and, and a little bit of trial and error, 
you know, St. Paul says, do not despise prophecy, test everything, hold fast to what is good. In that case, he's talking about prophecy, but you could say the same thing about hospitality. You could say the same thing about words of knowledge. You could kind of like test these things. If you think you have a charism of, of administration, put yourself in a place where administration is needed and see if it's good. See what comes of it. See if it gives you life. See if uh, you feel like you're operating at your fullest extent when you're doing those things. But some of the best ways to identify your charisms is to operate in a community and then ask the other people around you, hey, what, what am I good at? And it's not just good, but like, what, what, do, what do, when I'm doing different things, when do you feel like I'm most alive? When do you feel like I'm most kind of like my best self? We just went through this with my wife. We were trying to figure out some of her uh, charisms. And I realized like, uh, and I'm not even sure what this, the definition of this, but her, her gifting is to enhance environments. So she's just really good at whether it's the environment of the soul in front of her or the, our home or our backyard or something. She's good. She's incredible at taking something that exists and helping it be better and be more life-giving and more alive. That, that's, that's a God-given gift that she has. And we've discovered that over time of her doing it in a variety of different ways, seeing the fruit from it, and then identifying it. And so to be able to be in a community where charisms are expected, um, charisms are celebrated, and charisms are affirmed goes a long way. And then just knowledge of the various charisms is huge. So read the New Testament, read Paul, read um, some of the different writings of the fathers on charisms and the role of the Holy Spirit. And that'll go, that'll help just form your mind to be able to put words to some of the experiences of, wow, yeah, when I get up and I talk to people about Jesus, I just feel this burning in my heart. Okay, so what is that? Is that a charism for preaching? Or is that a is that more of an evangelistic charism of, of helping people make a decision? There's a whole variety of ways, one spirit, many gifts, right? And we've all been given something to build the kingdom. And so it is part of our responsibility to learn what those are and uh, be grateful for them and then to live in them. Thanks, Pete. Um, I have a follow-up question of my own. So um, I'm asking, you know, as a layman um, who works to build the kingdom of God, what would you like to see from your priests um, and, and I, I ask this just in all authenticity, what would you, what would you like to see from us uh, to help empower the laity to use their charisms? What are some things that um, priests, because Vatican II and, and even the catechism teach that the shepherds have to discern charisms and so on, but we're also not there to suppress them. And we're, we're there to, to um, encourage within the parish life especially um, that they are used effectively. So how do you see us as, as supporting um, the baptismal call of, of the laity to, to evangelize and what advice can you give us? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that. Um, I, we, we use something with our ID missionaries, the Mount Reach I, I run called the three C's. And I think it applies very closely to uh, priests too. The three C's are champion, coach, and companion. And uh, champion mean being the primary intercessor on behalf of a group of people, being the champion of the, the people's needs before the Father. And so I think we need our priests to be men of tremendous prayer, uh, both in the quiet of your own home, but then also in leading the community in prayer. I mean, just uh, obviously in your priestly role at, at Mass and the sacraments, but just in general, just being kind of carrying with you an atmosphere of prayer. In particular, I think intercessory prayer would be huge in terms of taking the needs of the people and bringing them to the Father and inviting the people into those that, that prayer as well. So champion, I think, is huge. Coach, especially as it pertains to the charisms, being able to be the one who's looking and kind of saying, all right, I see this in you. And I don't even know if you see it yet, but I'm going to, I'm going to help identify it in you. And I'm going to coach you in how to, and stuff like what you're doing right now, father, with this discipleship workshop and series is critical. But then the, then the next step too, of being able to say, all right, who's coming to these things. And what have I started to learn about them? What have I heard from, you know, we had an event the other night and Susie did this and I don't even think she realizes, but that was, that was her operating in her cares. I'm going to pull her aside after mass and say, Hey, I heard you, I heard this is what happened at the event the other night. I want you to keep leaning into this and I'm going to coach you and I'm going to give you more opportunities to so be waiting because I'm going to give you more opportunities to step into that. That's, uh, there's an adage in business that if you want to scale something, you want, you need to do unscalable things. And what that means is like, if you want something to go wild, you actually have to do a lot of the things that don't 
naturally make things go wild. So like in customer service, you can't, if you're trying to build a product that everyone in the world's going to buy, you can't give each individual person $50 gift card every time they, they, they purchase the, the item. Right. But if you do that a few times, it actually, if you do it for a few people, it spreads and it actually creates kind of a movement of customer service that's going to support the whole thing. And I think that's the same thing at the parish. Not every parishioner needs the same level of coaching from the priests, but when the priests are able to coach a, a few people that they feel called to coach at a higher level, it will have an exponential impact on the rest of the community. So we need you to be uh, champions, coaches, and then companions just to be accessible and walking with us along the way. Um, and I, I think you see this with Jesus, right? He spends a lot of time uh, in prayer before the Father alone. He spends a lot of time coaching his disciples uh, and what to do and what not to do. And then he walks with them and he invites them to walk with him. And, and he models for them both in who he is and what he does. But then also uh, he just goes where, where they are going. He says, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so um, I think those are some things that we as a, a community are longing for is just more more companionship with our priests and and i think some more direct coaching as well okay thanks so much pete uh do you want to close with any any final thoughts i just say that um you know evangelization is is not easy and it's often very intimidating and it's also often full of failure um but gosh is it worth it not only for the eternal destiny, but even just here on earth, that there is a uh, few things more delightful than seeing somebody come to faith and see somebody who is, who is dead in their sin, who is trapped, who's scared, brought into a new life with Christ. And so I just think as a Christian community, if we can just discover and rediscover the joy of evangelization, the joy of the gospel that Pope Francis talks about. What is the joy of the gospel? The joy of the gospel is the, the fact that we get to participate in the salvation of our friends and family. We get to play a role in the transformation of lives all around us. And so that joy should propel us be through some of the more difficult times. And so uh, I just commend all of you who are a part of this, who are wherever you are on the spectrum, whether you're totally on fire or whether you're scared out of your mind, I don't really care. The fact that you're even giving it a shot uh, speaks volumes to what faith is in your heart. And the Lord sees that he honors that, and he will give you what you need if you continue to cry out to him. And so I just want to encourage you. Thank you for following father, Chris, keep listening to this man. Cause he's a holy man. He is those three C's that I've already, I just described. And, um, yeah, I'll be praying for you. Thanks again, Pete. Let's just end with a quick prayer for, for each other in the name of the father, Please. the son, the Holy spirit. Amen. Um, Lord God, I just thank you for the opportunity, uh, Pete to share his faith with all of us and uh, his charism. I see the bless of all those in his life um, that he's uh, currently building up and supporting in that mission of evangelization, but also uh, those that he's uh, reaching out to uh, to introduce for the first time, perhaps uh, to Jesus as a as a loving savior. I ask you to bless our family of parishes. May it also share in the same fire of God's love and. Uh, and seek to build that relationship with him, with trust, with docility, um, but also with zeal for souls, uh, for their salvation. And we ask also to help us uh, improve our prayer life, improve our relationship with you, God. We just ask for the total renewal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we ask this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God bless you, Pete. Thanks again.